of engineering simulation software experience with roles uh, leading product management and marketing communication organizations. He currently uh, is the product manager for SOLIDWORKS Plastics. Uh, second is Matthew Fourcad, um, who is uh, the product marketing specialist here at SOLIDWORKS. So, Peter, thank you, and I'll hand it over to you, sir. <coughs> Thanks, Cliff. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, glad to be here today. We do have a lot to cover, so I'm going to get started right away. I'm going to start by asking a question. Are you involved in the design of plastic parts? And you can select on your screen. The easy one, yes or no. As you can see, Peter, 87% yes. Great. So I guess it's good that I did a presentation regarding the best practices of plastic part design. So here we go. Before I actually jump into the best practices for plastic part design, I think uh, it's appropriate to give a, a little overview of the injection molding process. What you're looking at here is an injection molding machine. If I take that machine and I break it down into a couple of simple components, on the right-hand side, we have what's called the injection unit. On the left-hand side, the mold clamping unit. We take some plastic pellets. We put them into the back of the machine. They travel down along the length of something we call a screw in a barrel. That's what's, act that's what's actually melting the plastic. Once the plastic is melted, it gets injected into the mold, which gets melted over there. It cools down. The mold opens. The parts come out there. It all seems relatively simple. It's actually a very complex process. Now, actually, if I break that down, if I break the process down even a little bit more, I'll show you what it looks like graphically here. I'm going to switch and uh, show you a little movie of what exactly happens when uh, we're running an injection molding machine cycle. So here you see the plastic melt being injected into the mold cavity. It's on, it's cooling down. Once it cools down, the mold opens. The part gets ejected. Mold closes, and another cycle starts. So again, the injection unit moves up to the mold. The plastic gets injected. Now we go into what we call the holding phase or the packing phase. That's where we hold pressure on the entire system until the gates freeze off. The part cools down. The screw retracts. The mold opens. The part comes out. So the reason why I wanted to show you that is that uh, you know what we're looking at here today are the design considerations for the injection molding process. Um, so we're not talking about just any plastic parts, but these are plastic parts designed for injection molding. And when we talk about uh, injection molded plastic parts, there's a, uh, at least a few main things that you uh, always want to keep in mind. Number one, maintain a uniform wall thickness. Uh, two, I'm going to show you how to follow some um, proper rib design guidelines. Uh, you should always gate from thick to thin, and you always want to try to minimize weld lines. And I'm going to explain all of these in more detail. First of all, when we talk about injection molded plastic parts and uh, maintaining a uniform wall thickness, what kind of thicknesses are we talking about? Well, typically, injection molded parts will have thicknesses that range from about 2 millimeters to 4 millimeters, or 80 thousandths of an inch to uh, 160 thousandths of an inch. I would actually argue that uh, up around 4 millimeters uh, or 160 thousandths of an inch, these parts are tending to get pretty thick. I think most parts that you come into contact with are going to be 2 to 2.5 millimeters to maybe 3 millimeters thick. Uh, on the opposite end, thin-walled injection molding. These parts might be down in the range of a half a millimeter or about 20 thousandths of an inch thick. And if you were wondering about what the minimum limit was, it's somewhere down around quarter of a millimeter or 10 thousandths of an inch. Now, you might actually be able to injection mold some applications uh, that are less than 10 thousandths of an inch thick. but uh, trust me, the flow lengths would not be very long. Uh, these would be very short flow lengths at these very um, thin wall thicknesses, and the uh, injection times would be extremely fast, on the order of maybe uh, 0.1 to 0.2 seconds. Now if we take a look at some more detail regarding uniform wall thickness, again, number one rule, maintain uniform wall thickness. Why do you want to do that? It promotes uniform filling and packing. Now, when we talk about filling, this is the, I'm talking about the profile of the melted plastic as it flows through the product cavity. So the more uniform that is, the more likely it is that, the more likely it is that you're going to, going to get a part that has uniform molded uh, part properties. It also promotes uniform pressure distribution and uniform temperature distribution. So basically, anything that you can do to achieve a uniform filling pattern, a uniform pressure distribution, and a uniform temperature distribution is going to uh, maximize the quality of your part. It's also going to allow you to avoid uh, certain types of defects that can occur after you take the part out of the mold. For example, post-molding warpage. Uh, maintaining uniform wall thickness also helps you avoid something called flow hesitation. Now, 
simply, plastic melts like to take the path of least resistance. That's always the thickest wall sections. So if the plastic melt is flowing through a part cavity and it comes to a, an area where it could go to a thick section or a thin section, it will always choose the thick section first. That could cause this phenomena that we call float hesitation in the thin section. If that hesitation is bad enough, the flow front can actually cool down, freeze off, and you won't be able to properly fill or pack out the thin area. Maintaining uniform wall thickness also helps you reduce cooling time and maintains uniform cooling. It can also help you reduce material usage, and that would also, um, you know, all of those things would help you lower your part uh, cost. Now, if you look over on the right-hand side of this slide at the graphic, you see on the, uh, you know, the top right-hand side a very abrupt transition from thin to thick with a sharp corner. That's a really bad thing. Uh, number one, that sharp corner will result in a uh, stress concentrator. Uh, stress concentrator, so stress will be concentrated in that area. It would be, make the part likely to fail at the sharp corner. Mm -hmm. And because you have the, such an abrupt transition, you might experience some of that flow hesitation, where the thick section fills first and the uh, thin section cools off before it can properly fill out. A little bit better, you add a chamfer to the sharp corner. Uh, that makes the transition a little bit better, but still not that great. Um, even a little bit better, we, uh, the third one down, you have a gradual transition from thin to thick. But really, the best thing to do, core out the thick section, as we show on the bottom there. Core out the thick section uh, and maintain a uniform wall thickness throughout the entire surface area of your part. The next thing I want to talk about is rib design. When you have uh, supporting ribs that come off the surface of your, you know, the nominal wall surface, you tend to create what we refer to as a localized increase in wall thickness. Now, if that localized increase in wall thickness is big enough, it can cause a problem called sink marks. You have a, uh, such a thick area there that when the part starts to cool down, the plastic material actually shrinks in upon itself, and it pulls in the surface of the part, creating this phenomena that we call a sink mark. If you follow proper rib design guidelines, you should be able to avoid sink marks altogether. Now, I think of primary importance, your rib thickness should be somewhere between 50 to 70% 70, 70 of your nominal wall thickness. So if your, let's say your nominal wall thickness was 100 thousandths of an inch, the base of your rib should be no more than 70 thousandths of an inch. Maybe even a little bit thinner would be better. That helps you uh, avoid that localized increase in wall thickness and avoid sink marks. Your rib height should be about two and a half to three times your nominal wall thickness. The rib should have anywhere from about a half to a degree and a half of draft. Uh, that helps in uh, part ejection. The radii at the base of the rib, so you should have radii at the base of your rib, number one. You shouldn't, you shouldn't maintain sharp corners down there. Those radii should be about 25% to 40% of your nominal wall thickness. And the distance between two ribs should be at least two to three times your nominal wall thickness. So following those simple guidelines will help you avoid a lot of problems uh, when it comes to rib design. With that, I'd like to ask our second poll question. Do you design or manufacture injection molds? I think most have voted, so I'm going to close the poll now. And as you can see, 77% say no. OK, that's great, because maybe I'm going to show you something new today. Um, because remember what I said, we're talking about design for manufacturability here. So as you're designing a plastic part, I think it's really important to keep in mind how will that part be manufactured. Of course, if it's injection molding, a mold has to get designed and manufactured. So it's important to take into account some of the considerations when it comes to the mold itself. And one of the primary things you want to do there is always make sure that you're gating or flowing from thick to thin. Uh, we already talked about how uh, plastic melts like to take the path of least resistance. That's always going to be the thickest area. So if you're gating from thin to thick, what can happen, again, you get these cooling effects in the thin sections. Uh, as you see up in the top left-hand corner of this graphic, we can get some cooling effects in the thin section that cause the thick section to be underfilled and underpacked. Now, that can cause all kinds of problems in the thick section. It might cause a part that's more likely to warp. It might cause those defects that we call sink marks. Here's what I would call a Band-Aid solution on the right-hand side here. We've added uh, what I would call a blind runner to our part geometry to help the filling and the packing even better. Um, what I don't like about that is I'm changing my part geometry to, um, you know, I'm adding a, a basically a useless feature to my part geometry from a functional standpoint to aid in the manufacturability. 
really the best thing to do here is just kind of switch the orientation around. If you have to have this transition from thick to thin, just simply make sure that you're always gating into the thickest sections of your part geometry. And the last thing I'd like to talk about when it comes to best practices in plastics part design is to minimize your weld lines. Now, weld lines, they can also be referred to as knit lines or meld lines. They are phenomena that occur when two or more plastic flow fronts come together inside of a mold cavity. So here on the left side of my graphic, you see a part that has, I've got a runner system coming down into two gates. Let's say my part's even a simple flat plate. But just because I have two gates or two injection locations, that means two flow fronts. That means I'm going to have at least one major weld line in my part. Another cause of weld lines are uh, core features, core pins, uh, you know, things like that. So I have a, even though I have a single gate in my cavity now, my plastic flow front has to come in travel around this core, you know, split up around the core and come back together on the other side, that's going to cause a weld line, a weld line. Why do we talk about these weld lines? Because they may cause problems in your molded part. They might cause a structural weakness. They can also cause cosmetic defects. Usually when you have weld lines, you can see them in the surface of your part. That may or may not be a problem. How can you minimize or eliminate weld lines? Uh, number one, minimize the number of gates in your part. So if you have a single gate only, you're going to minimize weld lines right off the bat. The minute you introduce a second gate, you introduce more weld lines. You can also control the position of your weld lines just by changing your gate location. So remember I said that they can cause a structural weakness. That's because weld lines are never as strong as areas of your part that do not have weld lines. But what you can do is change your gate location to maybe move that weld line that's in an area that's less critical from a structural standpoint for a given application. So after all of that, I'd now like to introduce you to SOLIDWORKS Plastics. SOLIDWORKS Plastics, it's, it's injection molding simulation software that it basically simulates the flow of melted plastic through an injection mold. It helps you predict and avoid manufacturing defects, eliminate costly mold rework, improve part quality, and decrease time to market. We think the value proposition is simple because at least 80% of the plastic parts that you come into contact with every day are injection molded. The injection molding uh, process, it's a complex mix of time, temperature, pressure, material, and tooling variables. And injection molds are expensive. They can cost anywhere from tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands to even up over $1 million for one mold. So if you make a mistake with your part design, your mold design, you have to rework that mold. The rework is going to be very expensive. In fact, we think that using SOLIDWORKS plastics to avoid just one round of mold rework can often justify the cost of the software. What I'd like to do now is hand things over to my uh, virtual colleague, uh, Matthew Forcade. First, uh, we wanted to ask uh, one more uh, question. We've got two more coming up later, but what plastic simulation software do you currently use, or uh, if you use any at all? Sorry about that, Cliff. <laughs> I'm very excited today. <laughs> so most people hard voted. To, it's hard to contain myself. So I'm sharing those results. 89% do not use one yet. So, great. Matthew's going to take you to a uh, take you through a few um, uh, use cases for SolidWorks Plastics. He's going to show you how, through the use of plastic simulation, you can achieve uh, some of those best practices in design that I was talking about. Now, let me introduce you SolidWorks Plastic. SolidWorks Plastic is a great new addition to SolidWorks because it's going to help plastic part designer to make sure they can actually manufacture the part. In this example, we're using a smoke outer with a top and bottom casing. And what we're going to do is we're going to focus all our attention on the top casing and see the type of parameter you can change, such as geometry, the material, or maybe the gate location to make sure you can manufacture these parts. We also have a couple of different tools within SOLIDWORKS that help plastic part designer to really easily design the plastic parts, such as mounting boss, snap, hooks, vent, all these kind of features that make your work a lot easier. But now let me just talk to you about SolidWorks Plastic. It's completely embedded inside SolidWorks. It's an add-in you can turn on as well. And it's very easy to use. For people that are used to work with SolidWorks simulation, it's pretty, pretty similar. It's a very straightforward approach. The first thing you want to do is to actually mesh your cavity mesh the part so that's what we're going to do it could be a simple cavity or if you if you're working on multi-mode layer you could do this as well 
first thing you do is you select the triangle size. You can also use a slider if you want, if it's a little bit easier for you to use. And what we're going to do is simply use local refinement to make sure we have a, a great mesh here. And as you can see, it's pretty, pretty quick. And in just a matter of seconds, we our cavity is mesh and we're ready to go. So this is really one of the step to do before running it is uh, selecting the material and then the get location. Luckily, SolidWorks Plastic comes with a huge database of commercial plastic grade materials. You've really like more than 4,000 of them, so you can be sure you're going to have the plastic you want. And in this case, we're going to start by using uh, polycarbonate. We're using a generic one, but you know, there's a lot of different polycarbonate here provided by manufacturers. If you're wondering where this material is from, usually plastic part manufacturers send some samples of plastic materials so that labs can test them and so that we can get like some accurate values some accurate properties finally what i want to do here is simply select the get location i'm just going to change the orientation of the part and select where i want to put my gate and just like that we're ready and we can actually run this analysis to really see how the melted plastic flow inside the cavity and now it's going to fill this cavity and you're going to see it's pretty it's pretty fast we still speed up a little bit this so that we don't spend uh, two minutes waiting for the results and uh, as you can see i directly have a preview so that i can instantly know if you know i set up my my study properly and um, by default the result pop up so that i can see uh, even if the analysis is not done yet i can see a couple of results um, I can even animate if I want to fill time plot to, to, to see the plastic filling the cavity. And, you know, like, like simulation, you have a lot of different results you can use. And all these different results are going to be very helpful to determine if there's no problem. So in this case, you know, we worked a bit with the simulation team and they told us they had a bit of concerns with all these little thin ribs. Uh, so Kind of a weak point on the part so we want to make sure we don't have any problem with this and as you will see in a second by animating the fill time plot we can see that um, these ribs are not going to be filled completely and there's going to be some kind of back filling so going to create one line so we're going to see this in a second right now the analysis is done we have the result advisors that give us some information we don't need this right now we're just going to animate the fill time plot and again you can see the plastic filling the cavity so right now, by looking at this, we can see we have a bit of a rest track effect with the thickness on the side, maybe a little bit thicker than the rest of the part. And we have a couple of white lines on these little ribs. So that could be definitely a problem. That's something we want to be careful with. You can also have a look at the hair track. And again, you have a lot of different results you can have a look at. Pressure at the end of fill. Here it's uh, around 40 megapascal, so it's, it's fine. Uh, we can look at the again fill time plot, the volume shrinkage as well. Uh, since the part is pretty much the same thickness everywhere, it's fine. The cooling time is going to give us some great information about the overall cycle time. And again, we can look at the sink marks here. Uh, that's pretty negligible. So you know, lots of different ways that you can have a look and at, and you know, depending on the part you're working on, it's definitely going to give you some great insight. So the second example we're taking, we're actually now switching to another design we did. You know, we can try, it's so fast, actually, you can try so many different scenarios. And in this case, we simply redefine a bit the geometry with a little bit thicker ribs so that the plastic flow better in there and a uniform thickness everywhere. So the rest track effect is a little bit, little bit more limited, but we still have these wet lines kind of like almost at the middle of this uh, long, thin ribs. And again, you know, we know it's a weak point of a part, so we definitely want to avoid having some backfilling here. So that's something, again, we want to be careful. And the great thing is that, you know, you can try so many different scenarios long before you even produce this part. So we tried, uh, we tried with a different geometry. Now we, we can try actually with a different get location so that that's what we're going to do again prepare different kind of examples so we don't have to run the study again and we can see different results here so we we, sw we, we switch from uh, having the gate on the top to having the gate on the side 
And with this new gate location, it's a little bit better because the wet lines are going to be very close to the to the thick part of the part, so that uh, from a structural standpoint of view, it's a lot better. And you know, as you can see, the plastic feels just just fine here, and uh, so it's definitely a better approach, a better solution. But again, you know, different gate location mean we can also have different problems, and that's why all these different results plots are interesting. Because if we now have a look at the pressure at the end of fill, we can see that the pressure is a lot higher because we have to push really hard to fill all of these little ribs at the beginning. And 120 megapascal is pretty high. It's actually uh, kind of like almost the limit of what a typical machine can do. So that the last thing we want to change is the last parameter we want to change is the material. Uh, again, you can run different. Use, for example, also work simulation to try different plastic materials. And we saw that uh, a mix of uh, ABS and PC was just fine. And so that's what we, we're doing in this case. Instead of using uh, polycarbon, we're using a mix of ABS and PC. And the good thing about it is that, you know, it fills apart the same way, but the pressure at the end of fill is a lot smaller. So that it's a lot better for what we want to do, especially since we want to do at the end multi-cavity family mold layout. So now that we optimize this part and we're ready for this, we can go to the next step, you know, really creating and testing our family mold layout. So the important thing about doing a family mold layout is that you're going to be sure this way that uh, the colors, uh, mechanical properties are the same for, you know, the two parts of the casing. So that's what we're doing here. It's very easy to use as well. You can design any type of runner you want. So that's what we did. We designed the runner system and we can, again, run this very quickly. And you can see that, you know, the first thing we want to check is that the cavities, all the cavities are filling properly. So in this case, we're really happy. But one problem we have is that uh, they can see some of the cavity are filling faster than the other. And this is definitely a problem because typically you're going to have, you know, mechanical problems here. You might have flashing, you might have another type of defect. So again, service plastic can help you predict and avoid manufacturing defects. And in this case, being able to rely on a simulation software like Sorox Plastic also helps you to balance this runner because Sorox Plastic has some specific function to do that so that we can really make sure these two parts fill at the exact same time. So as you can see here, we balance the runner automatically using Sorox Plastic. And now we, we know for sure that the two cavities are going to fill properly and at the same time. So we have a we have an okay pressure at the end of fill. Uh, we, we're comfortable with this, and in addition, you know, we, we eliminated a lot of manufacturing defects. So again, it's a very quick example. We went through a lot of results, but it's just to show you that there's so much you can do. It gives you great insight into your design, so that you can, you know, predict all these problems and act ahead of you know manufacturing ahead of production to make sure you design problem-free plastic. All right, so to summarize, um, best practices in plastics part design, if you remember nothing else, maintain uniform part wall thickness, follow rib design guidelines, always gate from thick to thin, and always try to minimize weld lines. And then when it comes to SolidWorks Plastics itself, using SolidWorks Plastics during the earliest stages of part and mold design helps you to predict and avoid injection molding manufacturing defects, eliminate that costly mold rework, improve your part quality, and decrease time to market.